Right. Let's get going. Hi, everybody. We're going to talk today about DevSecOps and how to get security at the pace of uh, DevOps. A little bit about myself. I'm the COO at Sneak. And Sneak is all about helping uh, developers use open source and stay secure. I started my experience in the security space all the way back to my uh, days in the Israeli Defense Force in the cyber part of it. I then spent roughly a decade in risk and uh, fraud working at Fraud Sciences, which got acquired by PayPal, then founding another payments uh, company. I am a pract practitioner security consultant, but most importantly, I'm a developer. And so DevSecOps, DevSecOps is the, the buzzword uh, du jour, and like every other buzzword, it comes with good connotations and uh, bad connotations. And wh what I love specifically about this is it embodies the long set after a goal of getting developers to own security. It's giving it a name, and it's actually helping with the uh, momentum. But security itself is, is pretty complex, like you can see here in this uh, cyberscape, uh, cyberscape uh, image here. And buzzwords can't embody all the new ones that, that, that comes with it. And so if you put three experts today in a room asking them what does DevSecOps means, you'll get four different interpretations, five different meanings, and six different emphasis. And so today, I'm going to give you my interpretation of what DevSecOps means, and specifically three primary meanings to it, which mostly correlate uh, to, to the three meanings of uh, DevOps. And so in my perspective, Dex, DevSecOps is attributed as security for either DevSecOps technologies, either DevOps uh, methodologies, or DevOps shared ownership uh, philosophy, and I'll explain what I mean. So what does security for DevOps technology mean? Literally, it means applying security for the technologies that the Dev, DevOps wave brought into us. Some of those uh, key tenant technologies are cloud, are containers, are uh, serverless, are open source. And so how do, we change our, how, do, how do we change to support these technologies in a DevSecOps way? One way to do it is take existing security products that were for the old ages and build into them components that make them more friendly to, to DevOps. One example of that is container security, where we see uh, some of the big vendors like Symantec, McAfee, Trend Micro, which had a, uh, traditionally great endpoint protection tools that look for malware, look for network uh, detections. And as a server evolved from a server to a virtual machine to container, it seemed that those tools might still be uh, applicable uh, to containers as they were to uh, VMs. But in practice, the container introduced a new paradigm of this uh, split shift between the host and the container, and it wasn't trivial for these tools uh, to support them out of the box. And there we saw an adaptation over time in the industry where companies like Trend Micro introduced adaptation to support containers in, in their 10th version of the deep security product. And this version does deal with that nuance and the split between uh, the host and the container. So how else uh, do we support new technologies that get introduced uh, in the DevOps world? Well, there's new security needs that get introduced, and so we can build uh, new technologies to secure these uh, new security needs. And here we see companies like Evident.io and Cloud Checker, which will go and scan your, your cloud products and look for bad configuration problems, will look for uh, storage buckets, which are publicly open, uh, leaking credentials, uh, and the likes. And so supporting new tech generally requires novel thinking and it's a little bit harder for the big companies, uh, the, the incumbent companies. And here, this is where we see a lot of uh, startups excel that are able to attack these new techs from, uh, from the ground up. And we believe this will continue to show a lot of M&A in the space. And a great example of that is container sandbox breaking. And in containers, there's an oscillation between the host and the container. But this isn't perfect. And of course, one of the risks is that malicious code is able to break outside of the container and inspect the host. And since hosts are now running multiple containers, and sometimes these containers are coming from different companies or have different uh, sensitivities, this is a new and emerging security problem. And here we see companies like Twistlock and Aqua specifically built from the ground up uh, to protect against these kind of uh, problems. 
Um, another thing we saw with the Deva page is the proliferation of the open source uh, usage uh, across the board. And here, companies like Sneak help, help you with your open source compliance, where we automate the discovery of the open source components that you're using, and also which open source licenses are being introduced into your, into your applications. So uh, DevOps brought with itself uh, not only technologies, but also the introduction of new methodologies that change how we work in the DevOps space, some of them being uh, continuous delivery, uh, microservices, later serverless. And what the, all these lead do is faster development and granular components, both of which introduce new challenges and adaptations that are required to support them in, in the new age. And so, for example, with the introduction of a continuous delivery, what went away is the ability to stop and do an audit. And so in the old age, when we had two releases a year, the security team could come and inspect the application for a month and say, okay, I approve it or don't approve it. And that all went away and that requires adaptation. One uh, great place where we see ch such adaptation come into play is with static analysis tools. Okay, static analysis is very complicated and typically it takes hours if not more for a single scan to, uh, to run. And this of course doesn't lend itself very well to the type of uh, nature and automation required for continuous development. And the adaptation that emerged in the market is what's called incremental scans where the static analysis tools just take the newly added code and don't need to inspect uh, the entire application and therefore lending itself better to a DevOps kind of uh, mindset. Another new methodology that got introduced in the DevOps world is microservices. And so in the old days when we had a monolith app, there was just one app, it was well defined, the inputs were defined, the outputs were defined. In this is microservices world, the out boundary is now a little bit more fluid and there's a mesh and there's a convoluted type of uh, IO between all the microservices. And so the old way, uh, old way of observing attacks and what an attack looks like in the microservices world really changes and here we see companies like uh, Apparato change the way they conceptualize this and actually track intra-service uh, IO and uh, able to give you better visibility into attack vectors in this new kind of microservices world. Another new methodology that gets introduced is containers. And so, of course, containers bring in many great things, but also many more challenges. But some of these challenges actually introduce new opportunities. And so the way containers are used is mostly in a stateless type of environment, and they're pretty cheap to, to spin up. And this introduces a killer new feature, pun intended, that you can uh, actually kill the container. And here we see companies like Pivotal with Pivotal Cloud Foundry that actually killing the containers is an integral part of the, integral part of the, the platform where every a few minutes or a few hours you spin up the container again from a fresh new state or you spin up a new container from a fresh, uh, from a known good state after you observe the attack or some anomaly that you, you can detect. And this is actually a very, a very great adaptation uh, to methodology. Another one we see, we see is uh, the introduction of uh, Git. And so developers in the DevOps world use this fantastic new developer collaboration uh, method, uh, GitHub or, or, uh, or the likes. And here we see the tape adaptation where companies Again, like Sneak, bring the feedback to the developer where the developer is already at, at GitHub, instead of asking them to come to our dashboard and observe these uh, vulnerabilities. And here, by putting a check status, uh, we, we can flag pull requests which introduce new vulnerabilities uh, without having the developer come to our tool. And so, um, DevOps for methodologies is a broader interpretation of, uh, of DevSecOps and uh, technologies is. In the long run, if you invest in methodologies, it will get you more value than just focusing on the technology. And it also has a very interesting side effect of driving actually a new related technology adaptation. And this brings me to the, to the third interpretation of uh, DevOps, which is a shared ownership of a philosophy with, with a overlap between the process of tech and the people. And so the DevOps journey taught us to instead of thinking from tech and methods, to think about people and collaboration. And that running software is everybody's problem and go against the, the, old, uh, the old problem of developers throwing their code over the fence and having ops people manage it for them. 
And the cultural shift means that today, developers want to write a more operable code. Apps treat infra as code. And there's a plethora of software and tools to make all this uh, work at scale. And DevSecOps is uh, following suit. And so we believe that the only way to truly get uh, uh, DevSecOps at the, space of, uh, at the speed of uh, DevOps is that you need to get uh, developers and apps embedding it into their regular processes. And so for most companies that uh, we work with, we observe that there is roughly 500 developers for every ops person and for every security person. What this means is that the devs need to take the bulk of the security work, the ops need to take the remainder of the work, and the security team is left to empower and to govern what those two teams do by, by dialing the knobs of the various security tools. And so here we see a big challenge for all tools uh, to, to adopt to this mindset because they built, were built from the ground up to cater to the security persona, they sponsor security events, and they have an ingrained uh, go-to-market that uh, relives this and emphasizes it. And they, they traditionally, again, focus on tooling for the InfoSec person, and the developers are an afterthought. And here's where we say, if you have an Eclipse plugin, it doesn't mean you're a dev tool. And so actually what we see is that the dev tooling companies are, are better suited to win this uh, DevSecOps and this DevSecOps uh, world. And give a few examples here and showing you a screenshot of uh, Chrome developer tools. And so embedded in the Chrome browser, there's ability to scan for uh, front-end vulnerabilities like you see here with the audit feature. You see companies like uh, GitHub introduce security alerts and uh, get wide adoption for it. And this might be the golden era for, for startups to win the DevSecOps uh, space because dev tooling is typically much more capital efficient than their security counterparts, specifically because the uh, cost of sales to a developer is much lower than it is to a, a CISO or security persona. And this gets even uh, more emphasis since all the CISOs are continuously bombarded by, uh, by all the vendors. But if inside the organization, they have internal dev adoption, it's a very strong signal of a tool that they should bring in and that will uh, bring value to the organization. And so example of uh, dev tooling companies that do security that are very successful, one of them is uh, Auth0, which are tackling the authentication space, and they've won over the developers with great documentation, bottom-up pricing, uh, open source community, and programs, and this can be manifested uh, by their Series D $55 million raise. Another example is uh, Sneak, my company. We help uh, find and fix vulnerabilities and open source uh, dependencies. Uh, we focus on the dev persona throughout. We've built uh, uh, integrations with all the dev toolings, with source code, with build pipelines, support all languages, IDEs, and uh, past platforms. We do a lot of uh, thought leadership across speaking at events uh, like this, publishing on our uh, blog, and we've integrated very intimately with, uh, with the Git flow and uh, put an emphasis on automated remediation, like you see here, uh, fix pull requests which we initiate, help automating the fix of the vulnerabilities, making it accessible to all the developers inside the organization, even those which have lower security, lower security knowledge. And so, to recap, DevSecOps, like DevOps, has uh, multiple interpretations. Securing DevOps for technologies means one of two, either adapting existing solutions to work with the new stacks or building new tools to support new security concerns. Securing DevOps methodologies means changing when and how you introduce security controls to impact your application. Adapting to DevOps shared ownership means getting the devs and the ops to own more of the security responsibility and activity. And so my belief is to truly embrace DevSecOps, you need to start with adopting the philosophy, which will lead you to the right methodologies, which will eventually uh, get you using the appropriate technologies. And so today when vendors say that they support DevSecOps, uh, you can use this framework to better understand what exactly that means and ask yourself where does it help you and your company in your own DevSecOps uh, journey. 
Questions? Yes, sir. So first of all, that was something that wasn't available before the introduction of containers, right? So VMs take a larger time to, to spin up and definitely physical servers even, even more time. And so just the, the fact that containers introduce these abilities is one of the remnants of, 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 uh, of DevOps. And so the dis relative disadvantage of it is that, okay, you need to build all the or orchestration to do it and it's not something uh, simple. But the good part is that there are a lot of these uh, platforms and uh, solutions like P Pivotal Cloud Foundry that do it for you even behind the scenes even without you knowing. So a lot of the threats, a lot of the big uh, security breaches happen with, with the attacks that get planted and over time propagate themselves inside your network. And so it's not a, a pin attack where I send the payload and I get back your, your data. It's actually stuff that happens and matures uh, over months. And so your ability to kill the container and to uh, respawn, uh, respin it uh, shrinks that time uh, that the, the malicious code has to, to spread in the network. And it is really effective. It's one of the, one of the more effective ways to, to prevent uh, vulnerabilities. And again, even known ones and unknown ones. So even if you know you got attacked and even if you didn't know you got attacked, this is still a clever thing to do. More questions? Yes, sir. Have you encountered any of the scenarios where doing an incremental scan uh, uh, after thirty seconds uh, tends to miss the big picture from doing a like a complete scan of the of the entire application? And so, I guess I'm not. So the question was: uh, Does incremental scans uh, does it tend or can it get to a, a place where it's missing the big picture of doing an entire scan? And so I have, uh, I guess I'm not the authority on static analysis uh, tools, and that's a great question to ask uh, folks from Fortify or for uh, check marks that exist here. But of course, it, there, there's always a, a trade-off. It's always best to do a complete run, but that's uh, excessive and takes a lot of uh, resources. And one of the key things is you want to give the continuous feedback inside your pipeline, which often outweighs the additional extra, uh, maybe things you can discover by doing uh, I got a full scan from scratch. Other questions? Yes, sir. Could you provide some examples of responsibilities a developer would take to uh, promote So uh, a few examples I've showed here, and so, you know, one uh, authentication, okay, so this, this is a, a great one. And so the fact that Auth0 made it very accessible with APIs and great documentation for developers to own this, they just go integrate it and take the complete ownership of this. And then combined with the technology of Auth0, they've eliminated a lot of the problems that used to occur wh when you were doing authentication. So the management of tokens, the recycling of passwords, um, uh, the integration with a single sign-on, uh, et cetera. With tools uh, like Sneak, the developers would take the responsibility for uh, viewing and observing the vulnerabilities they bring with, with their open source packages and also have the ability to fix them without requiring uh, bringing in a security person. More questions? Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, two things. One, uh, please fill the, the survey that's available on the, on the application uh, of the conference. And two, come visit us. We have a booth at the expo hall. Thank you very much.